Coming up on Theater Talk. I love Gershwin. We all love Gershwin, but come on. Don't you think that the Broadway audience has now clicked over? This is the audience now for Smash and Glee. And <laughs> you hadn't mentioned Smash in two <laughs> seconds. You know, the, and these all, you know, our crew has set up a drinking game. They've decided every time Michael mentioned Smash, they're going to take a oh, swig. Here's and the camera. Whoa. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm the show's producer, Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel, star of the new NBC TV <laughs> series, Smash. Wait a minute, is NBC <laughs> going to pay us to have you say that? Absolutely not, full disclosure. <laughs> NBC is not giving us anything, but indeed, the biggest show on Broadway is actually not on Broadway now. It's a TV show. Everybody in the theater industry <laughs> is talking about it. It's called Smash. It premieres on NBC in February, and yours truly is one of the performers. <laughs> so, Susan, any questions for me about Smash? <laughs> <laughs> How did you enjoy my TV show? <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 you can't pick up. I was acting without speaking right, in the pick, great tradition of the point. artist. Pick up. Since clearly Susan has been stunned into silence by my performance in Smash, well, I want to ask our it. panel tonight about the impact that what I think is a groundbreaking TV series is going to have on the cultural landscape of America. We are joined tonight by <laughs> Jesse Green <laughs> of New York Magazine, <laughs> who uh, wrote... Um, a 10 or 10 or 15 page spread on Smash in New York. Michael Musto from The Village Voice, who I know will be writing about huh. Smash. I, I'm so proud of the way you hectored your way into a recurring cameo. <laughs> Thank and you very much. If only Julie Taymor had given you a cameo in Spider-Man. <laughs> you would have raved. You would have raved. I ran into Julie last night at the Smash premiere, which I'll tell you about in a Name second. dropper. And my, <laughs> and my old friend Patrick Pacheco, who I believe you're writing a several thousand word piece for the LA Times about Smash. And, and, and you it's, interviewed me uh, for It's all about you, Michael. I know. It's of course. You got some little show. A, Premiering out in Staten Island, is it? <laughs> no, it's in New York. Oh wait, Patrick is, has co-written some something or other called "My Life with Men and Other Animals." <laughs> I'll bet <laughs> at the Malloy College, March eighth and 9th, out in Long Island, and then it moves to the Forty Fifth Street Theater, March fifteenth through the eighteenth. And you you have to offer Michael a cameo role in it if you want it to go anywhere. <laughs> Absolutely, I better rewrite before, it. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> before we get to Smash, though, Patrick, I do want to ask you: What is "My yeah. Life with Men and Other Animals" about? It's about uh, a coming-of-age tale by Maria Cassia Florentine, performance artist, and uh, her life uh, as an actress and her relationships with men and other animals. Wow. How's that sound? You <laughs> but back to Smash. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to get it. What was it like to work with Christian Borle? <laughs> All right, it all It's about love, death, seduction, and Smash? all that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, in all seriousness, let's talk about Smash because it's on everyone's <laughs> lips these days. Um, you do know that Smash is not, in fact, a play, right? You, it's an yeah. NBC TV series, <laughs> okay. so I'm told. Jesse, this is. Does the success of Smash tell us <laughs> that Broadway. It hasn't even started yet. <laughs> <laughs> does it tell us that Broadway has now launched itself into the mainstream of popular culture after all these years of being in the backwater of the entertainment industry? If it succeeds, it might say that. We don't know whether it will succeed, but the reason Smash happened is because of the failure of Broadway to be able to nurture its own talent, or at least that's how I see it. Would you expand on that, please? Well, it's very hard for. Uh, People at the level of uh, brilliance of some of the writers and uh, creators of this show to get work done at a level that, that matches their abilities. So where do they go? Surprisingly, to television. Yeah, yeah. The last place you would ever think. And yet, here they have this niche in which to really try to practice the musical writing craft at the highest level. On an NBC TV series. Uh, Michael, is it, has Glee paved the way for... Smash? I was going to say that Smash is not the first show. Glee certainly dabbles in show tunes, uh, and so it did expose Broadway material to a mass audience. And for years before that, talk shows have exposed Broadway shows to a mass audience, starting with Ed Sullivan, Rosie O'Donnell, and Theater Talk! talk. <laughs> <laughs> Which is now on at 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> and, <laughs> but that's when theater Syndicated. people watch TV. <laughs> They're patterning Smash after West Wing. The question for me is, is Smash edgy enough? Does, are the stakes high enough uh, to uh, justify that comparison? 
wait till episode nine when I appear. And then, <laughs> my God, the heat for one page, is, Michael, the heat is turned, <laughs> for two seconds. The heat is turned up. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, uh, I can't have the whole show taken up by Smatch as much as I would like to. Uh, let us talk about the offerings coming up in Broadway in the spring. And Susan, would you like to join the conversation now? Silent this whole time. Oh, you, oh, I'm back in. And by the way, we should say that Susan was supposed to be on Smash, but unfortunately her scene was was cut. So no, they never shot it because they got mad at you, and then they <laughs> cut us both, and then you but got I, yourself back in. So but, but that's I, entertainment, everybody. <laughs> 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 what, did, what did I say, by the way, when uh, when your scene was cut? I said you said that was inevitable. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. All right, let's talk about the, uh, uh, the the new shows coming up this spring. We have, interestingly enough to me, sort of a reunion, Jesse, of Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice after all these years with their two biggest. This is shows. like a, a reunion of Godzilla and Frankenstein. <laughs> I, I don't, I'm not sure it's a reunion we want to attend. Jesus Christ Superstar and Evita. Two groundbreaking, terrific musicals, both giving um, uh, uh, new souped-up revivals. Are you looking forward to either one, or is just the same old tired revival syndrome on Broadway? I, you know, I'm looking forward to the performers in uh, Evita. I think it's an interesting cast. Uh, Ricky Martin, I'm curious to see what he's going to do. H.A. Um, Michael Service, a, a, you know, a terrific Broadway actor, and the newcomer, uh, Elena Rogers. Don't cry for me. I, I'm willing to give that show another chance. Jesus Christ Superstar, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> now, I no, I love Superstar. And we had this season we had Godspell, which had Jesus as a kind of bleach blonde surfer dude. <laughs> so now Superstar is back, because there are two, two Bible musicals every year, apparently, <laughs> to reclaim the role of Jesus as a long-haired rock and roller. <laughs> Andrew Lloyd Webber and, and um, uh, Tim Rice, they did revolutionize the musical with these two shows in some ways. But they, hadn't, they haven't worked together in years. I mean... What's what went on between the two of them, I and mean, what do we know from the historical record about why that partnership broke up? Well, I think all partnerships have a limited shelf life, and I think that was simply yes. <laughs> <laughs> I happened to see Jesus Christ Superstar in La Jolla, and I liked it a lot. You did, really? yeah. I didn't think I would because I'm not crazy about the show, but Des McEnough did a directed. great yeah, job. Did. Who directed it? Did a terrific job, and Jesus is a brunette surfer dude. It's kind of a biblical <laughs> Jersey Boys. But we're talking here about shows that may succeed on the basis of covering up their fundamental problems. So yeah. what's the fundamental problem <laughs> <Yeah>. about Avita? <laughs> well, uh, let's begin. Uh, do, do we have an hour? I mean, <laughs> Cut the, to the, chase. the character of Eva, of <laughs> Eva Perone. I mean, because it glorifies fascism. That was the complaint against the show originally. I think the original production was masterful, yeah. but exactly in the way we're talking about covering up fundamental problems of structure. Uh, and character and politics, for heaven's sake. But, but shows always do that. I mean, hair yes. has fundamental problems. But can and, we talk about some easier. that at least we don't yet know <laughs> are, are fundamentally flawed because On we a haven't clear seen day them you yet? Can see forever. How about that? <laughs> well, no. There's a lot of new things coming in. Yeah, that's gone. Besides yeah. Smash. All right. Besides Smash, which is uh, which is marvelous. Um, there's another show that I think also could be groundbreaking. Nice work if you can get it. An old Gershwin catalog. Gershwin's show. nice work if you can get it. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I mean, Michael, I mean, I love Gershwin. We all love Gershwin, but come on. Don't you think that the Broadway audience has now clicked over? This is the audience now for Smash and Glee. And <laughs> you hadn't mentioned Smash in two seconds. You know, the crew, and these all you know, our crew has set up a drinking game. They've decided every time Michael mentions Smash, they're going to take a oh, swig. Here's so the camera. Whoa. Ser yeah. Serious, serious moment there, Michael. Right. I mean, don't you think that these tired old Gershwin catalog shows that there's no audience for these things anymore. I don't, well, wasn't crazy for you recently? Oh, that was 25 <laughs> years ago. Exactly. Well, I don't know. At least they're not just doing a review, which is the laziest you know, format of all. And they're not doing a jukebox show. They're actually creating some kind of plot. The names here have pretty good pedigree. I don't think this will be embarrassing, but I'm not Sylvia Brown. <laughs> you're, you're <laughs> the famous psychic from oh. the Maury Povich show. <laughs> I think I, you've asked the wrong person <laughs> whether it has current relevance or not. Retro right. theater talk. <laughs> There's always been an audience for that, though. I mean, look at the grossest for anything goes, which which has been a hit and which has been extended through September. Uh, so, and it's the same director and choreographer, Kathleen Marshall. Marshall. Yeah, yeah. So I wouldn't underestimate it at all. I think it has a good chance of succeeding. Jesse, your your sense about this old Gershwin catalog show? Hmm. You know, it's, I'd rather see them doing something else, honestly. And the Gershwin Estate is not high on my list right now. <laughs> Why? Well, because of calling Porgy and Bess the Gershwin's yeah. Porgy and Bess, eliminating the contributions, the 
crucial and beautiful contributions of some of the authors in doing yeah. that. And in seeming, I, you know, I, people disagree with this, but in seeming to be more about trying to extend the life of the copyrights and bring in more cash than about protecting the work. Yeah, well, the problem is that there are all of these great-grandchildren who live on these works that were created by their genius. Well, either I want to be one of them, <laughs> or I want them to stop it. <laughs> Point well taken. And you, but you're absolutely right. You can just see they're trying to milk these things for all that they will do anything. They will debase these great songs in this catalog just so that they can keep buying their country houses. Are you appalled by this, Michael? <laughs> and why Wait, not? People in theater want to make money. Oh, this is, this is appalling. Absolutely. This has to stop. All right. Speaking speaking of of of, of living on the royalties of of. of of your dead father, Death of a Salesman, yeah. the great Arthur Miller play, <laughs> is coming back, Patrick, with um, um, Philip Seymour Hoffman in the part. My initial reaction to that is Philip Seymour Hoffman strikes me as, as being too young to play Willie Loman. Yeah, he, he could well be. I'm not quite sure how old Dustin Hoffman was when he played him, probably about the same age. Yeah. There's also Andrew Garfield. Uh, and Linda yeah. Eman, who's just a fan yeah. fantastic. Yeah. I, I, well, it's, you know, it's being directed by Mike Nichols uh, after a, a very rare misstep of the country girl, country mm -hmm. wife? The country, country girl. girl. Country girl, which the was country a disaster girl, on Which was a disaster. A rare misstep for, for uh, Mike Nichols. I, I would be very surprised if this was not a success. And, I, you know... He's the one that said that um, casting is 90% of a director's job. And when asked what the other 10% is, he said, correcting your casting mistakes. <laughs> so uh, I don't think he'll have to correct this casting mistake. Michael Phillips, Seymour Hoffman, is Willie Loman. Do you see it? Do you sense it? Is uh, sure. I mean, he is a great actor, but the, the high watermark of my theater-going experience was the Brian Dennehy, Brilliant. Elizabeth Franz, directed by Robert uh, Falls production. Yeah, absolutely terrific. Um, this one has, as I've mentioned before, a teen idol, Andrew Garfield, so there'll be screaming girls in the audience. I can't cry, Willie. Woo! Woo! <laughs> yeah, it's going to be so bizarre. <laughs> Um, Jesse, Death of a Salesman, I mean, is it a play that we could see every year? Is it that pretty, pretty much. It's that good. It is that good. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that Nichols is doing that I, I find fascinating and you will laugh at mercilessly um, <laughs> is uh, he is using the original set design, slightly modified by Joe, Joe Melziner. Joe yeah. Melziner, which yeah. were brilliant and changed the course of uh, Broadway design. And it'll be fascinating to see them in use again. And for the, for those of us who didn't see the original production, as you apparently did, the Joe Melzino <laughs> sets, what, what, were, what was groundbreaking about those sets was that this was a realistic play taking place in a, mi in a man's mind, and the sets reflected that. You could say that, but it's really much more specific and technical. He, he, he uh, mastered the use of scrims in order to change the scenes by simply changing the lighting the scrim could disappear or appear, and you could see other rooms, other places, and it made a, it, it really introduced the whole cinematic quality of staging mm. that had not previously been part of the uh, stage experience. Wow. Mm, that's pretty impressive, I must say. Where'd so, Evita, Ev Death of a Salesman, and Superstar, really innovative stuff this year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, we have a lot, we actually... Oh, and the Gershwin season. musical. Well, there are actually <laughs> a large number of new works this year, especially new plays. Uh, yes. Well, like Shackner's World, We Just Live in It, <laughs> the Bill Sha William Shackner is coming to Broadway with his one-man show. Patrick, I mean, is this something that could revolutionize not only set design, but playwright. <laughs> you know, uh, wig design, possibly. Uh, it may well be. I have no idea what he's going to do. I'm not quite sure that <laughs> television paint. stars necessarily turn into box office, but I think in this case it probably may well uh, be. He's, he's quite an eccentric character. Well, Michael, you have anything to say about J William Shackman? Just when they get rid of the special <laughs> events category, the good ones I come know. in. You know, <laughs> I mean, no, I, I loved him in the Twilight Zone with the gremlin on the wing. Oh, <laughs> and Star Trek I never heard of. I don't know. <laughs> you know what? I, I'm looking forward to Clyburn Park that won the Pulitzer Prize. That's coming back. Yes. Did you see Who that cares? in the I, I never No, it's, it's, <laughs> you, you will care. It's, it's a fantastic play. Yeah. What's and, it about? and I think it will be, well, uh, the, uh, it's, it's a, hmm. the first act sort of takes place right after the action of the original Raisin in the Sun. That family that leaves the ghetto yeah. tries to move into a white neighborhood. And Sounds like the Jeffersons. <laughs> so w w we see uh, the, the, the attempt the to The remarks of Michael <laughs> Riedel have no reflection on the producers <laughs> of Theater Talk. That's right. All right, Jesse, continue. <laughs> We see them trying to move into to buy the house in this white neighborhood. Then we jump uh, many years, and the neighborhood, which became mostly black once they moved in because of you know blockbusting and all that, 
um, is now yuppifying, and now the heirs of that black family are selling it to young white people. And, it's and this sounds like a riveting play to you, Michael? I don't see anything off Broadway, because if it's any good, it comes to Broadway, except for Ruined. I missed Ruined, which won every <laughs> award. It didn't come to Broadway. But I've, I used to hang out with the playwright's brother at the Roxy, so I have connections here. I can get comps. <laughs> and uh, I've heard marvelous things about it. There's yeah. another play coming in from London that uh, I just, everyone who sees it is raving about it and still laughing about it, One Man, Two Govs, which is uh, an adaptation of the Goldoni classic, uh, the, the Servant of Two Masters. Uh, Patrick, I hear it's absolutely... Hit Hilarious coming from the National Theater. You, what, what are you picking up on this play? I saw the uh, National Theater's uh, televised live. Yeah, they did live, a movie. Yeah, they, yeah, live thing. Live and, and it's extremely funny. It's probably much funnier in person than it is, um, you know, when you're watching it in a in a movie house. Um, the only thing that I thought is that it's a bit long, uh, and it does wear out its welcome. I mean, farce usually lasts ninety minutes. I think this will ran well over two hours, maybe even two and a half hours. Maybe they should just have one governor. <laughs> <laughs> that, that might be. It does feature an extraordinary performance by Tom. Help me out here. James Corden. James, uh, Gor James Gordon. James Corden. Who was the the fat kid in um, um, History Boys? History Boys. Alan That's Bennett's right. And uh, yeah, a, an extraordinary performance. Uh, Michael, is this going to be geared to the uh, the Downton Abbey crowd? Is this one of these? No, I think this is very lowbrow humor. But yeah. because it's British, it seems higher brow. <laughs> and James Corden will sweep. Many awards. He's, I, I, he's, he's the shoe, and I think for the Tony for best and actor. It, to it's play in the year. same tradition of the season of Don't Dress for Dinner, right? Uh, oh, another the Boeing, Boeing. I mean, it is farce. Well, it, it, certainly the success of Boeing, Boeing is is behind uh, the enthusiasm for bringing this show. And here. Don't Dress for Dinner. Don't Dress for Dinner. And Don't Dress for Dinner is a sequel to of, Boeing, 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 Boeing. I yeah. mean, I, I don't understand why they bring in the lowest common denominator of what you'd watch on television. Haven't you just answered your question? <laughs> <laughs> Because it makes money. Boing, boing. I know. Was a hit. I know. I know. All right. Well, I think lowest common denominator is now the new uh, brand phrase for Broadway. Yeah, we are. <laughs> no, no. The new brand for, phrase for Broadway, gentlemen, is smash. Thank you. <laughs> there is a very interesting yeah. play coming called The Columnist, written by the guy who wrote Proof, whose name That's is right, David Auburn. David Auburn. And this play is about an old, very powerful political columnist back from the 30s and the 40s and 50s, Joseph Alsop. What's this play telling us about? It's it? absolutely a fascinating uh, study of the Cold War period. And he was a conservative Cold Warrior, a uh, powerful Washington player. Yeah. Who in Close 19... to Roosevelt and presidents. All the presidents had the president's ear. Kennedy, uh, friend of Kennedy's. Friend yeah. of the Kennedy's. Um, goes to Moscow in 1957, has a sexual liaison with a Russian, young, a young Russian male who's a setup. The precursor of the KGB takes all these pictures of them in this hotel room, presents them with him and says, now you're one of us. Mm. And he immediately takes those pictures, asks for a copy of them, they're not going to give him the originals, <laughs> and uh, marches right over to the American embassy in Moscow and says, shows them the pictures. And it sort of goes from there. It's wow. absolutely a fascinating uh, play that I believe involves Alsop. I don't know if it involves his brother. His brother was also a famous were, yeah, columnist, Stuart, Stuart Alsop. Yeah. Uh, Stuart Alsop. Uh, his wife, the young man, and... Uh, and this is yeah. the third, literally, time in a row John Lithgow has played a columnist. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet smell of success, Mr. and Mrs. Fitch. No, that's yes. true. That's very that's good. True. And, now, and, and she's starring in, in this. I mean, does this intrigue you, Jesse, this play? The very much, but I, I I don't know how you know so much about it. I, 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 Wikipedia, <laughs> Wikipedia. I, I, I don't I think have to the read play. Joseph Alsop's memoirs. <laughs> no, I mean the play itself has not been produced elsewhere. It's it's open no, it's, and cold yeah. right. here, Manhattan which is a new Club. thing. Yeah, yeah. Manhattan yeah. Theater yeah. Club. But I mean, I, this this intrigues me. Doesn't it intrigue you, Michael? Anything with a columnist, obviously, <laughs> is holding up a mirror to my soul. And also the blackmail angle kind yeah. of reflects on Best Man, which is being revived, which is about whether somebody, a candidate, should be smeared or not That's with true. inside information. So, What is fascinating about Gore Vidal's The Best Man is that the, the politician you want to win, you should want to win, is modeled on Adlai Stevenson, who was every intellectual's dream candidate. But he could never win. And the politician who does win is modeled on Richard Nixon. And what Vidal says in this play, that if you're not willing to do what it takes to seize power, you don't deserve the power. Fire well, in the belly. Yeah, that's right. Fire in the belly. That's right. It, it's also known as Gore Vidal's the best man. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
that's his. What about Debose Haywood? He helped. It's going to be called the Gershwins, the best. But I got soon enough. But but this is fascinating though, because these two plays, the columnist and the best man, draw on same time. Yeah, the same same time, politics. Well, I, I think we're really interested right now yeah. uh, in, in first of all, in elections and politics, yeah. obviously, but in what that time in which people really fought dirty uh, has to say about what's going oh, on Oh, unlike now. now, right? Well, no, I mean, too yeah. much like now uh, after a period of sort of pretending that that wasn't all going on. Yeah, and who's in, who's in um, uh, The Best Man? James Earl, be James Earl Jones plays the African-American ex-president. Uh, Angela Lansbury plays the Ann Southern role. Uh, Eric McCormick who used to star in Will and Grace with Deborah Messing, who's now in... Smash! <laughs> <laughs> no, and Michael and... Riedel's. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's an all-star cast, and I, I actually think this play still has relevancy. All right, we only have a couple minutes left, so let us hit a couple of things that sound like real clunkers to me. Uh, <laughs> Ghost, Patrick, I mean, you've been, you go back and forth to London all the time. Have you seen it? I haven't seen it. A friend of mine recently saw it and, said... and was surprised by how much he liked it. Yeah. I think a better trend is actually the adaptation of kind of mediocre movies. That always made more sense to me. Why do a good movie as a I musical? agree, yeah. That never works. But we have Newsies based yeah. on a so-so movie, Leap of Faith based on uh -huh. a huh. <laughs> and, uh, and Once based on a weird well, Can I just say something about movie. Once at least? I, it was... They have a bar on stage. <laughs> <laughs> which, which I recommend to anybody who's producing a new musical. Have a bar um, on stage. Particularly on Critics' Nights. <laughs> uh, you know, I didn't particularly love the movie itself. I thought the production, which was done downtown earlier this season at uh, New York Theatre Workshop, which also uh, developed another musical that's opening this season, um, was one of the best productions of a show I've ever seen. I th listen, I think once divides the audience. You're either, you either fall for that weepy, sentimental little love story. I didn't say I liked it. flesh crawl. And my <laughs> flesh was crawling out the door from that first well, dirge-like, sad well, Irish, it's raining, we're all drunk song. <laughs> One after another. But they have a bar on stage. <laughs> now, now before every, we... so, every song sounds like, and I'm so loo. But it, it's beautiful. Before, before, Bring me Finian's rainbow any day, please. It, I think in terms of, of once, what it certainly has going for it is, is a superb, superb production. And it also has that date night quality. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, all right, it's weepy, sentimental. Gee, that's Phantom of the Opera, weepy, sentimental. How, how about the Phantom of the Opera? It's got, you know, that big song, No More Talk of Dark. And this has... And sing me one song from once. Falling. It's raining <laughs> outside here the in Oscar. Dublin. It's so cold <laughs> and lonely and dark. The Oscar winning song. And the girl was so oh. precious. I mean, like Sandy Dennis would have played this no, in the old days. All that was I want you to say hello to the piano every time you pass. <laughs> all that was missing was... I'm hugging you now. <laughs> It has. All that was busy. She should have had a, but limp, I liked it. a little limp there walking to the piano. <laughs> okay. It has the Oscar winning song and it has a great performance by Steve. What's Casey? the Oscar winning song? Can you sing it? It's sure. Go <laughs> I don't ahead. Want me to. All right. I can do Fan of the Opera. I can do the entire score. Can well, you that's because it's can you do been the running for 23 from years. Once? Can you do the Oscar winning song from once? No. You How's don't want go? me to. How's it go? Oh, we do. We do. We do. How's it go? Close us out, Patrick. Holly. <laughs> It's a flop. <laughs> I retract my praise. <laughs> you said the greatest thing you've ever oh, seen? No, no, I didn't. I thought the production yes, was really beautiful. <laughs> I do not care for the material, but I thought it was incredibly well. And you had how well. many drinks before it started? <laughs> I don't drink. Okay, I just want to say I'm looking forward to End of the Rainbow. Now we have to stop. Okay. One, she you says must one, be a 60 year old gay man. She says <laughs> one thing and no one has any idea what she's talking about. End of the Rainbow is a play coming from London about Judy Garland. Thank you, Susan, for explaining to the audience what the play's about. Jesse Green from New York Magazine. Michael Musto from The Village Voice. Patrick Pacheco, who can't even sing the Oscar winning song from his favorite musical. Patrick has his own show called <laughs> My so, life. What's it called? My life. My life with men and other animals. Do you want me to sing from that? <laughs> Please <laughs> spare us. And Michael Musto has a book. Fork on the left, knife in the back. Thank you. And Jesse Green, do you have? Anything? I have a dentist appointment. <laughs> there you go. All right. All right, Patrick, will you take us out with uh, falling from once? Uh, falling. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. Just Best do... you is my woman. <laughs> <laughs> I just cost you forty thousand dollars. <laughs> Midnight. Please, please let Steve. Don't cry for me, Argentina. Come on, Patrick. I These are hit you, songs. I know that you've got B-roll, so I'm praying that you end this program with B-roll from one, one. Smash. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh.
our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night. <laughs>